This is an ABC News special report. Now reporting, David Muir. Good afternoon, and we're coming on the air at this hour because President Biden is set to mark the history made just moments from now at the White House, the confirmation of Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson as the first black woman to serve on the nation's highest court. We will hear from President Biden and from Judge Jackson for the first time since her confirmation yesterday by the Senate. Three Republicans joining all of the Democrats, the president making good on his campaign promise to nominate the first black woman to the bench, the first in its 233-year history. The Senate confirming her by a vote of 53 to 47. As I mentioned, three Republicans voting in favor, Senators Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, and Mitt Romney. Democrats erupting into cheers to mark the achievement less than 24 hours ago. Senator Romney, uh, we took note, the lone Republican applauding as other Republicans filed out, walking past him. President Biden and Judge Jackson watching the historic vote unfold from the White House. There they are in the Roosevelt Room celebrating the moment yesterday, a hug. Vice President Kamala Harris, who of course made history herself when elected to be vice president, presiding yesterday, reading the final tally, confirming the country's first black woman to become a Supreme Court justice. Judge Jackson will not take her place on the bench until retiring Justice Stephen Breyer officially steps down after this term. She, of course, clerked for Justice Breyer earlier in her career. Her confirmation does not shift the balance of the court. It will still be a 6-3 conservative-leaning court. The White House with a large guest list for today's event, including Judge Jackson's family, all of the senators who voted to confirm her, the House Democratic leadership and members of the Congressional Black Caucus, among many others. The three Republicans who did vote for her were invited. They're not expected to attend. Senator Collins uh, has tested positive for COVID. Uh, the other two Republicans, uh, Senators uh, Romney and Murkowski, saying they will not attend. Current members of the Supreme Court will also not be there because we're told by our Supreme Court our reporter Devin Dwyer that there's no official vacancy right now on the court because Justice Breyer will finish out his term. So out of respect for him, the justices will not be here for this occasion. You're looking live at the South Lawn. And again, as I mentioned, you'll be hearing from President Biden. You'll be hearing from Judge Jackson herself. And in the crowd there today, Judge Jackson's family and we have taken note all along of those powerful moments. It was a heated confirmation hearing, but her family was there um, by her side every step of the way. Her proud daughters, her husband, the surgeon. Uh, there you see one of the, the images of them right there behind her during the confirmation hearings. Uh, there was that one image of her that we all took note of, Deborah Roberts, of her daughter looking over with pride. There it is right there. In so many, in so many words, don't mess with my mother. That exactly. look, right? A daughter by the name of Leela, I might add. Like yours. It's something we share in common. But there's something about that photo, the pride, David, and I think that that's what so many people have felt. You know, a woman who has come from humble beginnings and who had to work so hard to get there and to overcome obstacles, to have parents who had overcome obstacles, and to be there at the height of her her profession and her career. I think the pride and the work is what speaks so much for her. Her parents were looking at right there in that image, Deborah, and they are both public school teachers. But then that famous story of Judge Jackson remembering when she was a little girl with her coloring books across the table from her father studying his law books. Sitting next to him. And so that was kind of something that fed her interest in the law. I think that is what has grabbed so many people, this family. This is a, the classic American dream. Her parents uh, endured segregation, just as my parents endured segregation. But yet they raised this daughter who worked so hard, dreamed so much, and achieved achieved so much and that pride I'm telling you I mean I I dare anybody to look at that picture of those parents and of her children and not tear up a little bit to see the pride in this family of this accomplishment and Deborah you and I were talking before we came on the air I know you always sort of poll your family your friends your loved ones before you do these special reports and and you were saying uh, many acknowledge it's so important to mark history made but they look forward to a day when this history opens the doors to make this far more typical of what we see absolutely one of my friends said that I hate that it's sort of cloaked in this whole racial and gender you know discussion but at the end of the day you cannot acknowledge it cannot not acknowledge that this is a big moment it is a big moment and at the end of the day hopefully we will move on and now this will be normalized but all the little girls now David who will see this woman and think this is possible it's not a big deal that there is a black woman on the Supreme Court that's where we are at this moment I think of those little girls when I see that image of her own daughter looking over at her mother and I think of the little boys too because they all go to school in America today and this is what their classroom looks like. Exactly. And now the Supreme Court. A little bit is, more like America. Is catching up yeah. some 200 years uh, later. I want to bring in Mary Bruce, who was live at the White House. And Mary, this was a campaign promise from President Biden, uh, and he kept that promise. 
A campaign promise fulfilled, David, and I have to tell you, celebration is the word you used, and that is absolutely right. It feels a little bit like a party here at the White House. There are several hundred people gathered here out on the lawn. This is actually the biggest celebration that I've seen so far during the Biden administration. And people, this is a very happy, excited crowd. You have seen a who's who of Washington sharing hugs, taking selfies. I've even seen some dancing out here. And this really is a chance for the president to take a victory lap, not only because this is a campaign promise fulfilled, of course, his first pick to sit on the Supreme Court, but this huge moment in history. All along, Joe Biden has said that he wants the Supreme Court to look more like the rest of America. And today is a chance to celebrate this giant step forward in that fight. And the president has also always said he wants young people, especially young women, Ladies young black and brown people, to be able to look at the court United and see States themselves reflected in it. The second gentleman of the Mary United States. Bruce, competing a little with the music behind you there, Mary. Thank you for that. We're expecting to see President Biden come out of the White House, walk down the South Lawn, and there we see him. We see, that's the first lady, actually, Jill Biden, of course, and the second gentleman. Making their way to the seats to mark this day, Doug Emhoff, of course. Obviously, we're also expecting to see, following them, as they normally do on occasions like uh, this one, the president, the vice president, and of course, the woman who was about to make history, uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, confirmed now to the Supreme Court, uh, though we won't be sworn in until uh, after this term because Justice Stephen Breyer will finish out his term. And another powerful part of this is that she actually clerked, as I mentioned, for Justice Breyer, uh, part of the many steps along the path to get her to this moment. She said she will be a justice following in the path of Justice Breyer, but she'll bring to her role, a life experience unlike anyone else on the court, which is what makes all of these justices uh, sort of a fulsome body, as we all know, to bring what they've learned, uh, their life lessons uh, to the court and to represent the country. All eyes on that doorway. Impossible to know what it's like for Judge Jackson, though we will hear from her today. Just as we heard from her when it was announced when she was at the White House, and among the first comments she made at the White House when we watched that day were an appreciation of her faith, her family, and all those who supported her to get her to this moment. She said she was profoundly grateful to live in this country in this moment when this possibility could become reality. Not lost on her the history that was about to be made. We know in the White House that particular day was her husband, the surgeon she met in college, uh, proudly watching on as he did during the confirmation hearings as well. And here we the signal that the president's about to walk out. Let's watch. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, accompanied by the vice president of the United States and Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. <laughs> President with history really standing on both sides. The vice president he chose as his running mate who made history. And now Judge Katanji Brown Jackson who will make history on the Supreme Court. Joe Biden, First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, Second Gentleman, Douglas Emhoff, members of Congress, members of the Cabinet, members of our administration, and friends and fellow Americans. Today is indeed a wonderful day. As we gather to celebrate, the confirmation 
of the next justice of the United States Supreme Court, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. <laughs> President George Washington once referred to America as a great experiment, a nation founded on the previously untested belief that the people, we the people, could form a more perfect union. And that belief has pushed our nation forward for generations. And it is that belief that we reaffirmed yesterday. <laughs> Through the confirmation of the first black woman to the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> and Judge Jackson, you will inspire generations of leaders. They will watch your confirmation hearings and read your decisions. In the years to come, the court will answer fundamental questions about who we are and what kind of country we live in. Will we? expand opportunity or restrict it? Will we strengthen the foundations of our great democracy or let them crumble? Will we move forward or backward? The young leaders of our nation will learn from the experience, the judgment, the wisdom that you, Judge Jackson, will apply in every case that comes before you. And they will see, for the first time, four women sitting on that court at one time. So as, as a point of personal privilege, I will share with you, Judge Jackson, that when I presided over the Senate confirmation vote yesterday, while I was sitting there, I drafted a note to my goddaughter. And I told her that I felt such a deep sense of pride and joy. And about what this moment means for our nation and for her future. And I will tell you, her braids are just a little longer than yours. <laughs> but as I wrote to her, I told her what I knew this would mean for her life and all that she has in terms of potential. So indeed, the road toward our more perfect union is not always straight, and it is not always smooth. But sometimes it leads to a day like today. A day that reminds us what is possible, what is possible when progress is made, and that the journey, well, it will always be worth it. So let us not forget that as we celebrate this day, we are also here in great part because of one President Joe Biden, commitment 
a lifelong commitment to building a better America. And of course, we are also here because of the voices and the support of so many others, many of whom are in this audience today. And with that, it is now my extreme and great honor to introduce our president, Joe Biden. Thank you, Kamala. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The first really smart decision I made in this administration. <laughs> My name's Joe Biden. Please sit down. I'm Jill's husband and Naomi Biden's grandfather. And uh, folks, uh, now yesterday, uh, th this is not only a sunny day, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. This is gonna let so much shine, sun shine on so many young women, so many young black women, so many minorities, that it's real, it's real. We're gonna look back, nothing to do with me, we're gonna look back and see this as a moment of real change in American history. I was on the phone this morning, Jesse, with President Ramaphosa of South Africa. And he was talking about how the time that I was so outspoken about what was going on in my meeting with Nelson Mandela here. And I said, you know, I said, I'm shortly gonna go out, look, I'm looking out the window. I'm gonna go out on this, what they call the South Lawn in the White House. And I'm gonna introduce to the world, to the world, the first African-American woman out of over 200 judges on the Supreme Court. And he said to me, he said, keep it up. Keep it up. We're going to keep it up. And folks, yesterday, we all witnessed a truly historic moment presided over by the Vice President. There are moments that people go back in history, and they're literally historic, consequential, fundamental shifts in American policy. Today, we're joined by the First Lady, the Second Gentleman, and members of the Cabinet, Senate Majority Leader. We're, there you are, Chuck. Senate Majority Leader. And so many who made this possible. But, and today is a good day, a day uh, that history is going to remember. And in the years to come, they're going to be proud of what we did. And we're going to try what Dick Durbin did as the Chairman of the Committee. <laughs> I'm serious, Dick. I'm deadly earnest when I say that. To turn our children and grandchildren to say, I was there. I was there. That's, this is one of those moments, in my view. My fellow Americans today, I'm honored to officially introduce to you the next Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, Katanji Brown Jackson. After more than 20 hours of questioning at her hearing and nearly 100 meetings, she made herself available to every single senator who wanted to speak to her and spoke for more than just a few minutes, answered their questions in private as well as before the committee. We all saw the kind of justice she'll be, fair and impartial, thoughtful, careful, precise, brilliant, a brilliant legal mind with deep knowledge of the law, and a judicial temperament, which was equally important in my view, that's calm and in command, and a humility that allows so many Americans to see themselves in Katanji Brown Jackson. That brings a rare combination of expertise and qualifications to the court. A federal judge who has served on the second most powerful court in America, behind the Supreme Court. A former federal public defender with the, with the ability to explain complicated issues in the law in ways everybody, all people, can understand. A new perspective. When I made the commitment to nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court, I could see this day. I literally could see this day because I thought about it for a long, long time. As Jill and Naomi will tell you, I wasn't going to run again. But when I decided to run, this was one of the first decisions I made. 
I could see it. I could see it as a day of hope, a day of promise, a day of progress, a day when, once again, the moral arc of the universe, as Barack used to quote all the time, bends a little more toward justice. I knew it wouldn't be easy, but I knew the person I nominated will be put through a painful and difficult confirmation process. But I have to tell you, what Judge Jackson was put through was well beyond that. There was verbal abuse, the anger, the constant interruptions, the most vile, baseless assertions and accusations. In the face of it all, Judge Jackson showed the incredible character and integrity she possesses. Poise. Poise and composure. Patience and restraint. And yes, perseverance and even joy. Even joy. Tanji, or I can't, I'm not going to be calling you that in public anymore. <laughs> Judge, you are the very definition of what we Irish refer to as dignity. You have enormous dignity, and it communicates to people. It's contagious, and it matters. It matters a lot. Maybe that's not surprising if you look to uh, sat behind her during those hearings. Her husband, Dr. Patrick Jackson, and his family. Patrick, stand up, man. Stand up. Talia and Layla, stand up. I know it's embarrassing the girls. I'm going to tell you what Talia said. I said to Talia, it's hard being the daughter or the son of a famous person. I said, imagine what it's like being president. He said, she said, she may be. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Kataj, her brother, a former police officer and a veteran. Kataj, stand up, man. This is a man who looks like he can still play, buddy. He's got biceps about as big as my calves. Thank you, bud. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, her parents, Johnny and Elroy Brown. Johnny, all right, stand up. I tell you what, as I told mom, mom's rule in my house. Oh, you not think I'm kidding. I'm not. My mom and my wife as well. Look, people of deep faith, the deep love of family and country, that's what you represent. Who know firsthand, mom and dad, the indignity of Jim Crow, the inhumanity of legal segregation, and you had overcome so much in your own lives. You saw the strength of parents and the strength of a daughter that is just worth celebrating. I can't get over mom and dad, you know, I mean, what, what you did and your faith and never giving up any hope. And both that wonderful son you had and your daughter. You know, and that strength lifted up millions of Americans who watched you, Judge Jackson, especially women and women of color, who have had to run the gauntlet in their own lives. So many of my cabinet members are women, women of color, women that represent every sector of the community. And it matters. And you stood up for them as well. They know it. Everybody out there, every woman out there, everyone, am I correct? Just like they have. Just like they have. And same with the women members of Congress as well, across the board. Look, it's a powerful thing when people can see themselves in others. Think about that. What's the most powerful thing? I bet every one of you can go back and think of a time in your life where there was a teacher, a family member, a neighbor, somebody, somebody who made you believe that you could be whatever you wanted to be. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful notion. That's one of the reasons I believe so strongly that we needed a court that looks like America, not just the Supreme Court. 
That's why I'm proud to say, with the great help of Dick Durbin, I've nominated more black women judges of federal appeal courts than all previous presidents combined. Combined. That's why I'm proud that Kamala Harris is our Vice President of the United States. A brilliant lawyer, the Attorney General of the State of California, former member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Kamala was invaluable during this entire process. And Chuck, our majority, I want to thank you, pal. You did a massive job in keeping the caucus together, getting his vote across the finish line in a timely and historic manner. Just watching on television yesterday, watching when the vote was taken on the Democratic side, the very people, there was such enthusiasm, genuine. You can tell when it's real. You can tell when it's real. You did an incredible job, Chuck. Thank you so much. Oh. Because you're all able to sit down and don't have to stand, I'm going to go on a little longer here and tell you. <laughs> I want to say something about Dick Durbin again. Dick, I'm telling you, overseeing the hearing, how you executed the strategy by the hour, every day, to keep the committee together. And you have a very divided committee with some of the most conservative members of the Senate on that committee. It was especially difficult with an evenly divided Senate. Dick, I, I served as chairman of that committee for a number of years before I had this job and the job of vice president, as did uh, all the Democrats. And you did not stand, I think all the Democrats in the committee did. And uh, every Democrat in the Senate, all of whom voted for Judge Jackson. And notwithstanding the harassment and attacks in the hearings, I always believed that the bipartisan vote was possible. And I hope I don't get him in trouble. I mean it sincerely, but I want to thank three Republicans who voted for Judge Jackson. <laughs> Senator Collins is a woman of integrity. Senator Murkowski the same way in Alaska and up for re-election. And Mitt Romney, whose dad stood up like he did. His dad stood up and made these decisions on civil rights. They deserve enormous credit for setting aside partnership and making a carefully considered judgment based on the judge's character, qualifications, independence. And I truly admire the respect, diligence, and hard work they demonstrated in the course of the process. As someone who's overseen, they tell me, more Supreme Court nominations than anyone who's alive today, I believe that respect for the process is important. And that's why it was so important to me to meet the constitutional requirement to seek the advice and the consent of the Senate the advice beforehand, and the consent. Judge Jackson started the nominating process with an, an impressive range of support, from the FOP to the civil rights leaders. Even Republican-appointed judges came forward. In fact, Judge Jackson was introduced at the hearing by Judge Thomas Griffin, the distinguished retired judge appointed by George W. Bush. She finished the hearing with among the highest levels of support of the American people of any nomination in recent memory. So soon, Judge Jackson will join the United States Supreme Court, and like every justice, the decisions she makes will impact on the lives of America for a lot longer, in many cases, than any laws we all make. But the truth is, she's already impacting the lives of so many Americans. During the hearing, Dick spoke about a custodial worker who works a night shift at the Capitol. Her name is Verona Clemens. Verona, where are you? Stand up, Verona. I want to see you. you don't mind. She told him what this nomination meant to her. So he invited Ms. Clemens to attend the hearing because she wanted to see, hear, and stand by Judge Jackson. Thank you, Verona. Thank you, thank you, thank you. At her meeting with Judge Jackson, Senator Duckworth introduced her to 11-year-old, is it Vivian? Vivian. Vivian. I'm sorry, Vivian. That's her. Is that your sister? He's pointing. <laughs> Who's so inspired by the hearing, she wants to be a Supreme Court justice when she grows up. God love you. Stand up, honey. Am I going to embarrass you by asking you to stand up? Come on, stand up.
There's tens of thousands of veins all through the entire United States. She met Judge Jackson and saw her future. Means you're here today, and thank you for coming, honey. I know I embarrassed you by introducing you, but thank you. People of every generation, of every race, of every background felt this moment, and they feel it now. They feel a sense of pride and hope and belonging and believing and knowing the promise of America includes everybody, all of us. That's the American experiment. Justice Breyer talked about it when he came to the White House in January to announce his retirement from the court. He used to technically work with me when I was on the Judiciary Committee, and that's before he became a justice. He's a man of great integrity. We're going to miss Justice Breyer. He's a patriot, an extraordinary public service, and a great justice of the Supreme Court. And folks, <laughs> let me close with what I've long said. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in the, foot, uh, foot, foot, excuse me, the foothills of the Himalayas with Xi Jinping, traveling with him. I guess we traveled 17,000 miles when I was vice president. I don't know that for a fact. And uh, we were sitting alone. I had an interpreter, and he had an interpreter. And he looked at me in all seriousness. He said, can you define America for me? And I said what many of you heard me say for a long time. I said, yes, I can, in one word possibilities, possibilities. That in America, everyone should be able to go as far as their hard work and God-given talent will take them. And possibilities, we're the only ones, that's why we're viewed as the ugly Americans. We think anything's possible. And the idea that a young girl who was dissuaded from even thinking you should apply to Harvard Law School, don't raise your hopes so high. Well, I don't know who told you that, but I'd like to go back and invite her to the Supreme Court. She can see the interior. <laughs> Look, even the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Now, folks, it's my honor, and it truly is an honor, I've been looking forward to for a while, to introduce you to the next Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable Katanji Brown. Jackson. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. President. It is the greatest honor of my life to be here with you at this moment, standing before my wonderful family, many of my close friends, your distinguished staff and guests, and the American people. Over these past few weeks, you've heard a lot from me and about me so I hope to use this time primarily to do something that I have not had sufficient time to do, which is to extend my heartfelt thanks to the many, many people who have helped me as part of this incredible journey. I have quite a few people to thank, and, and as I'm sure you can imagine, in this moment, it is hard to find the words to express the depth of my gratitude. First, as always, I have to give thanks to God for delivering me as promised and for sustaining me throughout this nomination and confirmation process. As I said at the outset, I have come this far by faith, and I know that I am truly blessed. To the many people who have lifted me up in prayer since the nomination, thank you. I am very grateful. Thank you as well, Mr. President, for believing in me and for honoring me with this extraordinary chance to serve our country. Thank you also, M Madam Vice President, for your wise counsel and steady guidance. And thank you to the First Lady and the Second Gentleman for the care and warmth that you have shown me and my family. 
I would also like to extend my thanks to each member of the Senate. You have fulfilled the important constitutional role of providing advice and consent under the leadership of Majority Leader Schumer. And I'm ex especially grateful for the work of the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee under Chairman Durbin's skillful leadership. As you may have heard, during the confirmation process, I had the distinct honor of having 95 personal meetings with 97 sitting senators. <laughs> and we had substantive and engaging conversations about my approach to judging and about the role of judges in the constitutional system we all love. As a brief aside, I will note that these are subjects about which I care deeply. I have dedicated my career to public service because I love this country and our Constitution and the rights that make us free. I also understand from my many years of practice as a legal advocate, as a trial judge, and as a judge on a court of appeals, that part of the genius of the constitutional framework of the United States is its design, and that the framers entrusted the judicial branch with the crucial but limited role. I've also spent the better part of the past decade hearing thousands of cases and writing hundreds of opinions. And in every instance, I have done my level best to stay in my lane and to reach a result that is consistent with my understanding of the law and with the obligation to rule independently without fear or favor. I am humbled and honored to continue in this fashion as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, working with brilliant colleagues, supporting and defending the Constitution, and steadfastly upholding the rule of law. But today, at this podium, my mission is far more modest. I'm simply here to give my heartfelt thanks to the categories of folks who are largely responsible for me being here at this moment. First, of course, there is my family. Mom and Dad, thank you, not only for traveling back here on what seems like a moment's notice, but for everything you've done and continue to do for me. My brother Kataj is here as well. You've always been an inspiration to me as a model of public service and bravery, and I thank you for that. I love you all very much. <laughs> to my in-laws, Pamela and Gardner Jackson, who are here today, and my sisters-in-law and brothers-in-law, William and Dana, Gardy and Natalie, thank you for your love and support. To my daughters, Talia and Layla, I bet you never thought you'd get to skip school by spending a day at the White House. <laughs> this is all pretty exciting for me as well, but nothing has brought me greater joy than being your mother. I love you very much. Patrick, thank you for everything you've done for me over these past 25 years of our marriage. You've done everything to support and encourage me, and it is you who've made this moment possible. Your, your steadfast love gave me the courage to move in this direction. I, I don't know that I believed you when you said that I could do this, but now I do. <laughs> And for that, I'm forever grateful. In the family category, let me also briefly mention the huge extended family, both Patrick's and my own, who are watching this from all over the country and the world. Thank you for supporting me. I hope to be able to connect with you personally in the coming weeks and months. Moving on briefly to the second category of people that warrant special recognition, those who provided invaluable support to me professionally in the decades prior to my nomination, and the many, many friends I've been privileged to make throughout my life and career. 
Now, I know that everyone who finds professional success thinks they have the best mentors, but I truly do. <laughs> I had three inspiring jurists for whom I had the privilege of clerking, Judge Patty Saris, Judge Bruce Selya, and of course, Justice Stephen Breyer. Each of them is an exceptional public servant, and I could not have had better role models for thoughtfulness, integrity, honor, and principle, both by word and deed. My clerkship with Justice Breyer in particular was an extraordinary gift, and one for which I've only become more grateful with each passing year. Justice Breyer's commitment to an independent, impartial judiciary is unflagging. And for him, the rule of law is not merely a duty, it is his passion. I am daunted by the prospect of having to follow in his footsteps, and I would count myself lucky, indeed, to be able to do so with even the smallest amount of his wisdom, grace, and joy. The exceptional mentorship of the judges for whom I clerked has proven especially significant for me during this past decade of my service as a federal judge. And of course, that service itself has been a unique opportunity. For that, I must also thank President Obama, who put his faith in me by nominating me to my first judicial role on the federal district court. This brings me to my colleagues and staff of the Federal District Court in Washington, D.C. and the D.C. Circuit. Thank you for everything. I am deeply grateful for your wisdom and your battle-tested friendship through the years. I also want to extend a special thanks to all of my law clerks, many of whom are here today, who have carved out time and space to accompany me on this professional journey. I'm especially grateful to Jennifer Gruda, who has been by my side since nearly the outset of my time on the bench and has promised, has promised not to leave me as we take this last big step. <laughs> to the many other friends that I have had the great good fortune to have made throughout the years, from my neighborhood growing up, from Miami Palmetto Senior High School and especially the debate team, from my days at Harvard College, where I met my indefatigable and beloved roommates, Lisa Fairfax, Nina Coleman-Simmons, and Antoinette Sequera Coakley, they are truly my sisters. To my time at Harvard Law School and the many professional experiences that I've been blessed to have since graduation, thank you. I have too many friends to name, but please know how much you've meant to me and how much I have appreciated the smiles, the hugs, and the many Atta girls that have propelled me <laughs> forward to this day. Finally, I'd like to give special thanks to the White House staff and the special assistants who provided invaluable assistance in helping me to navigate the confirmation process. My trusted Sherpa, Senator Doug Jones, was an absolute godsend. <laughs> he was an absolute godsend. He's not only the best storyteller you'd ever want to meet, but also unbelievably popular on the Hill, which helped a lot. <laughs> I'm also standing here today in no small part due to the hard work of the brilliant folks who interact with the legislature and other stakeholders on behalf of the White House including Louisa Terrell, Rima Doden, Tona Boyd, Minion Moore, Ben LeBalt, and Andrew Bates. <laughs> I am also particularly grateful for the awe-inspiring leadership of White House Counsel Dana Remus. <laughs> <laughs> of Paige Herwig, where is Paige? <laughs> and Ron Klein. 
They led an extraordinarily talented team of White House staffers in the Herculean effort that was required to ensure that I was well prepared for the rigors of this process and in record time. Thank you all. Thank you as well to the many, many kind-hearted people from all over this country and around the world who have reached out to me directly in recent weeks with messages of support. I have spent years toiling away in the relative solitude of my chambers with just my law clerks in isolation. So it's been somewhat overwhelming in a good way to recently be flooded with thousands of notes and cards and photos expressing just how much this moment means to so many people. The notes that I've received from children are particularly cute and especially meaningful because more than anything, they speak directly to the hope and promise of America. It has taken 232 years and 115 prior appointments for a black woman to be selected to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. But we've made it. <laughs> we've made it, all of us, all of us. And, and our children are telling me that they see now more than ever that here in America, anything is possible. They also tell me that I'm a role model, which I take both as an opportunity and as a huge responsibility. I am feeling up to the task primarily because I know that I am not alone. I am standing on the shoulders of my own role models, generations of Americans who never had anything close to this kind of opportunity, but who got up every day and went to work believing in the promise of America, showing others through their determination and yes, their perseverance that good, good things can be done in this great country. From my grandparents on both sides who had only a grade school education but instilled in my parents the importance of learning, to my parents who went to racially segregated schools growing up and were the first in their families to have the chance to go to college. I am also ever buoyed by the leadership of generations past who helped to light the way, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Justice Thurgood Marshall, and my personal heroine, Judge Constance Baker Motley. They and so many others did the heavy lifting that made this day possible. And for all of the talk of this historic nomination and now confirmation, I think of them as the true path breakers. I am just the very lucky first inheritor of the dream of liberty and justice for all. sure I have worked hard to get to this point in my career and I have now achieved something far beyond anything my grandparents could have possibly ever imagined. But no one does this on their own. The path was cleared for me so that I might rise to this occasion. And in the poetic words of Dr. Maya Angelou, I do so now while bringing the gifts my ancestors gave. I, I am the dream and the hope of the slave.
So as I take on this new role, I strongly believe that this is a moment in which all Americans can take great pride. We have come a long way toward perfecting our union. In my family, it took just one generation to go from segregation to the Supreme Court of the United States. And it is an honor, the honor of a lifetime, for me to have this chance to join the court, to promote the rule of law at the highest level, and to do my part to carry our shared project of democracy and equal justice under law forward into the future. Thank you again, Mr. President and members of the Senate for this incredible honor. An extraordinary moment playing out on the South Lawn of the White House, the embrace right there between President Biden and the next Supreme Court Justice. The first black woman to serve on the nation's highest court, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. Judge Jackson, extraordinarily humble in her remarks. The level of gratitude, the names that she went down, uh, her family, her husband. She said, I did not believe I could do this. He told me I could. Now I believe it's possible. She thanked her parents for supporting her every step of the way, the public school teachers. Her father then became a lawyer. She thanked her daughters and said, though this is exciting this day, nothing brings me greater joy than being your mother. She said it's taken 232 years for a black woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, but we've made it, pointing to the crowd of supporters saying, we've made it. Deborah Roberts, she also used the words of Maya Angelou to talk about her ancestry, and also made the point that for her family, this should be something celebrated for all Americans, that it took just one generation to get from segregation to the Supreme Court. That's exactly right, David. Now we see why Leela was looking at her that way, because look at who we are now welcoming onto the Supreme Court. What I thought was so remarkable was this breathtaking speech was so humble, and she has achieved so much. She represents excellence to so many people. She acknowledged standing on the shoulders of others, but of course now we know others are going to be standing on her shoulders. And that is what is so remarkable. While this is a historic moment, yes, she's the first black woman, but I don't think for a lot of people that is really what this is about. This is a woman who just represents excellence, excellence and perseverance, which is what she talked about there today. I mean, how much she had to work, her parents worked. She's the American dream. So at the end of the day, yes, is it historic? Yes, but as she said, it's something for all Americans to celebrate today. That she is the benefit of the American dream is Absolutely. what she said. It took so many others to get her there. Absolutely, the dream and hope of slaves, as she said. So we can't forget that kind of imagery either, the fact that she came from so far and people who worked so hard, but she is there. And this woman earned it. She absolutely earned it when you look at her history. Deborah Roberts, always great to have you right here by my side. Mary Bruce standing by. Uh, she's live at the White House, and Mary, you reported uh, not only on then candidate Joe Biden, who made this promise to nominate the first black woman to the court, he followed through on that promise. Uh, he talked about uh, the meaning of this day, that people will look back on the history of this moment. The Vice President Kamala Harris, another decision he made, an historic decision. She talked about the letter she wrote to her goddaughter as she presided over the Senate chamber for this vote. The President has been surely tested. Uh, he has his critics, he has his supporters, but Mary, this will be a day that this administration remembers uh, with joy and with, with uh, enormous fondness. It absolutely will, David. And just to see the president up there standing next to these two remarkable black women, both the first in their roles, it is an image that will be uh, hard for many to forget. But you did hear the president saying, yes, you know, this was a promise that he made, a promise fulfilled, something he knew he wanted to do if he was going to be president. But he also made the point that he is going to keep it up because just as much as he knows that this is a moment, certainly for the entire country to celebrate, that this is just a moment, that there is a very long long road ahead. The president noting, of course, the attacks that Judge Jackson uh, took on throughout this confirmation process, even during her very own hearings on the Hill, that that is just an example of how much this country still has to do, how much progress still has to be made. But David, I have to tell you, when I think back
back uh, to this event, what will always stand out to me is just the look on Judge Jackson's face, especially as the president was speaking uh, about her life story, about her experience, that beaming smile, even as she was wiping away tears. It is a look that was repeated on the face of many women, many men, many of the young people here in the audience today. And to think of all of the persistent sexism, the racism that Judge Jackson has had to navigate to get to this point, to see her to finally have a moment to just relish in this accomplishment. It's just uh, pretty remarkable, David. It was remarkable for us too, Mary, to watch the wipe from the, the right eye, the tear now and then as the president was speaking, the vice president was speaking. And Mary, just a quick follow-up to you because something else that struck me, uh, obviously we expected her to thank her parents, her husband, her daughters, but the level of detail with her, with her thank yous, the names that we've never heard, quite frankly, before, the legislative liaisons with, uh, with the Senate, members of the, the White House staff who helped her along the way. I mean, she really did not forget anyone who helped her through this extraordinarily rigorous process. And in watching them, it was almost as though uh, they seemed surprised to hear their name in such an historic moment included uh, within her gratitude here today. Yeah, I think there were some who were surprised to be called out like that. Look, I think we as the public see a certain side of this process, and it is a grueling process. As Judge Jackson noted, she met with 97 of 100 senators. That is no small feat, and it takes a huge team to prepare someone for this, to guide them through this very complicated process, to guide them through the politics of this process alone. And for her to call out all of those people, I think uh, it's a very special moment for them as well. I can tell you, uh, it's very rare that you see this many White House staff efforts show up for a presidential event like this and they were certainly i'm sure very appreciative of it as yeah. well speaks volumes about judge jackson the person mary bruce our thanks to you and a quick question to rachel scott who followed the confirmation hearings up on the hill and, and rachel's with us now and you heard the president there say i i hope this doesn't hurt them but i do want to single mm -hmm. uh, single out the three republicans who did vote he always believed this could be bipartisan and you heard president biden today thank uh, senator murkowski of alaska he even plugged her re-election campaign he thanked uh, senator romney uh, brought up Romney's own father, who stood up at key moments uh, in history. And of course, he thanks Senator Collins as well. Yeah, it is no secret, David, that the president wanted bipartisan support from the very beginning of this process. He talked about how he asked for advice and that he wanted some consent from the Republican senators here on Capitol Hill. In the end, three did end up voting yes. None of them there today. Senator Susan Collins has since tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski, Senator uh, Mitt Romney, not there at that White House today. But the president once again saying that they need some credit, that they handled this process with integrity, a sharp contrast to the, his words for some of the Republican attacks from their colleagues, David. Rachel Scott, live on the Hill with us every step of the way here, Rachel. And I want to check in for one last question at the Supreme Court. Devin Dwyer covers the court for us. And, and Devin, we've been talking here that Judge Jackson's 51 years old. It's uh, why they believe that she'll be on the court for many years to come. She talked about uh, Justice Breyer there, who will finish out his term. Uh, but given her life experience, she does bring something very unique to the court now. David, a pivotal moment for the country, a pivotal moment for this court. No question she won't change the ideological makeup here, uh, but will, she will have a lasting impact, not just the first black woman, uh, the first Florida-raised justice, the first federal public defender. Uh, for the first time, we'll have four women on this court behind me. It's quiet here right now. They're out of session this week, but we expect a large celebration to break out later this afternoon, David. Uh, and of course, she will take that oath later this summer once Justice Breyer steps down. David. Devin Dwyer. Devin Dwyer, thank you at the court there today. And he mentioned the Florida roots, and she actually gave a shout out to the Miami Palmetto, a senior high school, and in particular, the debate team that she said early on helped her prepare for this role much uh, later in life. And, and and I leave you with this thought. She talked about the notes that came in from all over the country, all over the world. And in particular, she said the notes from the children and what they wrote to her saying they see in her the possibilities now for them. And perhaps that is the biggest legacy moment of this day. Our coverage continues on ABC News Live, abcnews.com. I'll be back with the entire team for World News Tonight. My thanks to Mary, Rachel, uh, Devin, and of course, Deborah right here with me in the studio. Thank you. I'll see you later today. Good day. This has been a special report from ABC News.